This is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask with your host, Dr. Judith Bryles on the Rockstar Radio Network. On the show today, you'll find out where book publishing is going and how to take advantage of it. How to identify and avoid publishing predators. What opportunities are emerging as the book trade evolves in new forms? How to avoid losing money and much, much more. Join us now as a variety of publishing pros will deliver insights and strategies to take the author to the next, next level of publishing. It's your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. Brought to you by Author You and The Book Shepherd on the Rockstar Radio Network. And now, here's your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. Well, one of my very favorite people in the whole world is going to be our guest for this hour, and he's known by, I think, millions, millions. He is the guru when it comes to book marketing, and especially deep diving into internet book marketing. His book is required purchase by all my book shepherding clients, um, 1001 Ways to Market Your Books, and I actually keep copies in my my office so they can just literally walk away with it and um, he will be one of our featured speakers at the author you extravaganza in denver colorado may 1st through 3rd next year so with that said welcome john kramer guru of all book marketing to your guide to book publishing how are you john i'm great judith thanks a lot hey, how, do you, how do you like to be the guru of all things book marketing how's that sound i thought that was interesting or, or we could do Emperor of the Universe. Ooh, I like that one. Or as long as <laughs> as long as we don't have clothes. But you may like clothes living down there in Taos, New Mexico. Uh, <laughs> all right, John, let's talk about what's going on in Internet book, uh, the whole strategy with Internet book marketing. I have said, and I've got it in my new little book uh, that's coming out here, this fall called uh, Snappy Sassy Salty, that the Internet is the town hall for book marketing today. And that, I, I mean, I truly believe that. And these authors who continue to dig in their heels and say, not me, I'm not going there, are not only stabbing themselves in the back, they're basically, I think, taking their book down with them. So... You know what? Where are we, and what are some of the things that you see that's happening that's new, um, and is has actually really dug in and become the norm? Well, I think first and mo- foremost, uh, the norm is that the authors now do have to market their books, and the shame is that there's still so many authors out there that don't want to do that part of writing a book, and you, you know if you care about your book. You have to spend the time marketing. I'm like most authors. I love just sitting up here in my cabin in the woods and just write and play and and do things like that. But I know I have to market, so I do that. Um, and I'm like most authors. I, I don't like marketing. I'm I much more like writing and playing. But you have to market. You have to get out there. And you know, for a lot of people, book marketing on the internet means oh, I'll be on Facebook and I'll tweet and you know, some things like that, and they think that that's a marketing plan, and that's not a marketing plan at all. Social networks are a tool, and they're a good adjunct to a real marketing program, but I see so many authors waste incredible amount of time on a social network without achieving anything, without selling any books, and, you know, to me, the ultimate measure of what's working and not working, of course, is, is it selling books? So what would be then? I think that that's a great segue here. So um, let's talk about that marketing plan that we incorporate social media as one of the tools you do. So if if I was a Josephine author coming into your door saying, oh, my God, tell me what to do, Master John. Master John is going to tell me what? He's not going to tell you anything if you ask like that. Oh! <laughs> what are you going to do to me? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So no, we'll the key, over. the very, the very essence, I think, of internet marketing is that you create relationships with top websites that are already targeting your core audience, the audience you want to reach. 
why reinvent the wheel when they've already reached them and they've already created that audience or, or created the means to reach that audience. So just take time to develop relationships with uh, the people that matter. And in this case, the people that matter are the ones that already control, uh, you know, already have what, what Seth Golden calls a tribe. That is, people that are passionate about the subject and are already following somebody. And that somebody already has the audience. Why not make use of it? But the way to do that is that you have to go and approach those people and then actually take the time to do something um, with them. And the key thing with any high-traffic targeted website or blog or email newsletter is that the way that they stay uh, high-traffic is by always having new content. And I guarantee you they're not inventing most of that new content. They're finding it from somebody else. Somebody else is giving it to them as a, as a trade, you could say, for promoting what they have to offer. And every top-rated website, you know, from things like Huffington Post and so on, are all using original content from other people that they give them, essentially. They don't sell it to them. They give it to them. But in turn, that high-traffic website or that high-traffic uh, blog will give a link back to you, and that link is what matters. It really does drive the traffic on the Internet. Google used to drive something like 80% of all traffic on the Internet. I don't think that's the case anymore. I would guess that Google is driving maybe 20%. I so think it's, that, it's all the other bloggers out there who are talking about you. Yeah, it's the people that are writing about you, who are linking to you, who are doing things like that that are driving traffic. And, uh, you know, and then, you know, obviously once you get, you know, some sort of content on another website that has a traffic, you know, the typical author website is sort of like in the Bermuda Triangle or in, you know, Area 51 of Nevada. I mean, nobody can find them. Nobody even knows they exist because they're, they're way off the mainstream. But the high traffic, uh, targeted blogs are right there in downtown New York City with incredible amount of traffic. And what you want is to siphon off a little bit of that traffic, a little bit of that passion. Because remember that the high traffic websites are high traffic for one reason. They match the passion of the people that keep coming back to them. And those people, because they are passionate and they're really interested in the subject, will follow the links that they're you know, leading websites, the websites that they are passionate about, uh, those websites, when they link to somebody, those followers are going to follow that link. They're going to come to your website, and that's going to be far more effective than anything you could possibly do on your own website or anything you could possibly do on your social networks, unless, of course, you have a million followers on Twitter or Facebook. But the typical uh, author has more like 25, 50, 300, 2,000, 25,000. That's not enough. But a high-traffic blog or website is, is going to have a million or two million visitors a month or at least 100,000 passionate followers coming to it. And that's the difference. That's what's going to bring traffic to your website. So, so I have... your job is to create the kind of content that those, you know, those high-traffic websites want and they are hungry for, and they will reprint and then provide the link back to your website. All right. Now, let me, I have a question about that because that, um, it, it, if you're going to create content, is this original content for every blog you reach out to, or is there, can you, can you slightly repurpose it, or can you send out saying, listen, I've got these, I've got these 10 blogs that have really resonated with my audience. I think they, they would resonate with your audience. Would you like to cherry pick? Um, from them I mean do you because some of them I mean I had someone approach me that said we would love to have you do it but we that what you've written can never have appeared anywhere else well heck <laughs> I write all over the place and yeah. there's you know how much originality what is original and what is um, faux original what's original is when you're approaching a high traffic website that you know is in the top say 10,000 to 20,000 on Alexa, 
A-L-E-X-A dot com. Mm-hmm. That's a relative measure of traffic. The top 10,000, 20,000, maybe even 30,000 websites should get original content from you. But the websites that are ranked 80,000, 100,000, 200,000, 2 million, uh, they, should, they, should get, they should have the opportunity to cherry pick your content. For example, I just had somebody uh, email me this morning saying, I want to reprint your 101 ways to blog as an author. And I wrote back and I said, no, you can't reprint the whole thing, but you can select five points and then point people back to my website. And, you know, so they can use some of my content, but, you know, so when you're approaching, let's say you're doing a blog tour and you're doing a blog tour with 50 different websites or blogs, well, you can't give them all original content and sleep at night because you won't have time. But exactly. you can offer them an article and say, pick five or ten points that you like, introduce the article, and then send them to this website for the rest of the story. And that's what I would do if I were doing an extensive blog tour. In fact, I'm working with somebody right now on that premise, and we're working on reaching about 100 to 200 blogs and websites uh, in October. And the way we're going to do that is by providing them with a good article, and then recommend they they pick five or ten, or uh, you know, actually about five to seven of the points that they like, and then introduce it and say, "Here's why we like what, uh, in this case, Noah is doing," and then they send the traffic to our website for the follow-up. This way, you get exclusive, curated content on every blog you appear on because the blogger is choosing what goes on there. And that's so much better than even, say, uh, a guest uh, blog post, because in this case, the blogger is active as well. And it's the blogger that people are following, not the guest posters. Uh, it's the blogger that people are passionate about, because the information he or she shares is what they like. It's what they've fallen in love with. It's why they come back over and over again to that blog, or they follow it on an RSS feed or something like that. So you want the blogger involved. You don't want to write a passive guest post that they simply put up there and and don't introduce it. Don't say, hey, this is great. It's incredible. You've got to follow it. Right. John, we'll come back. That's fine. We'll see you guys. This is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. With your host, Dr. Judith Bryle. And we'll be right back with more great information right after these on the Rockstar Radio Network. Is there a book in you or another? Author You will show you how to create, develop, and publish your book without being hoodwinked. If you already have a book out, You'll find a supportive and brainstorming community that's connected and creative no matter where you live. Author U brings in national experts for its book camps and annual author extravaganza held each May. It has regular meetings and delivers webinars for its members on timely topics. Through Author U's extensive network, members enjoy exclusive benefits, including significant discounts for a variety of services necessary to publish. The Resource, its online book publishing news magazine, is content-heavy and it's free. If you want to create a book that has pizzazz, punch, and panache, Author U is for you. If you're a hobbyist or a casual author it's not join author you today through its website at author you.org follow author you on twitter at author you and on facebook at author you where timely author and publishing tips and articles are posted daily author you where the author goes to become seriously successful Change the way you publish online. WaveCloud is a new form for authors to manage all their books' information in one place from start to finish, including pricing and listing summary. To learn more or sign up for email updates, visit wavecloud.com. Every picture tells a story. 
And it's a truism that people do judge a book by its cover. Nick Selinger and NZ Graphics have been in the business of producing superior graphic cover design and interior layout for self-published authors, independent and traditional publishers for years. He has developed a reputation for excellent work, fast turnarounds, and best of all, affordable pricing. NZ Graphics also produces ebooks and book marketing materials such as posters, sell sheets, postcards, bookmarks, business cards, logos, and more. Books designed for his clients have won multiple book awards, including Best Book Award by U.S. Book News, multiple Evie Awards from the Colorado Independent Publishers Association, Indie Book Awards, the San Francisco Book Festival Award, and Freedom Medal Award from Valley Forge. Visit www.nzgraphics.com or call 303-985-4174 for more details about making your book the success it should be. Mention that you are an FOJ, friend of Judith's, and that you heard about NZ Graphics on your guide to book publishing. Welcome back to your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask on the Rockstar Radio Network. If you want to write and publish a book, if you want to be successful as an author, your guide to book publishing, everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask, is for you. Stay tuned and you'll hear about statistics, scenarios, and strategies on what to do now to get you published. So let's get back to the show. And here again is your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. All righty. So John Kramer is with us, the guru of all things in book marketing, and we're talking about some strategies that he uses um, that for uh, blogging, actually getting in and building relationships with bloggers, the master bloggers out there who really rank in the at least the top thirty thousand via Alexa, and that um, and and really, I, I think a great strategy where he's saying, "Hey, you don't give them the whole enchilada. What you do is you give them a a." A huge and an articles per se, where they has multiple points, and then they can cherry pick some of the points, and then they go back to your website, links it to your website to pick it up. That that number one gets the reader over to your site, so hopefully they sign up and they start following you, and and in, and they will buy your fabulous book, um, and that it's more engaging for the person who is running the blog because they're going to have to write a little segue and exit uh, of sorts uh, to their followers about you and the blog itself. Does that make sense, John? Did I get that right? Yes, you know, but the key thing there is that in order to really have bloggers that really do something for you and, you know, send their pride to you, you really do have to create a relationship with them. <clears throat> and one of the best ways to do that, this is where you use the social networks most effectively, is to create relationships with other people. So if you want to get, you know, a high-traffic blogger to notice you, pay attention to you, the first thing you start doing is retweeting him, uh, sharing his blog posts, commenting on his Facebook posts, uh, you know, pinning something that he's done, and things like that, because they notice that. And over time, when you then approach them, one of the first things that happens is they say, oh, yeah, I've noticed you've been commenting a lot on my blog post or in my Facebook posts and so on, and that makes a difference. Now I'm ready to work with you. Now I'm ready to pay attention to you because you've worked to help me out and you've been doing it consistently. I have what I call Facebook stalkers and I love them because they're people that like everything I do. It's, it's amazing. I mean, nobody should like everything I do. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, they shouldn't. <laughs> But, but, you know, there are people that do. I mean, they, they just, you know, they're always commenting, they're sharing, they're, uh, you know, Google Plusing it, things like that. And I noticed their names. If they ever came to me for something, I would bend over backwards to try to help them. In contradistinction to somebody who just emails me out of the blue and says, I want something from you. And I'm going, who are you and why should I care? Now, 
personally, I do care. I care about everybody that emails me. But the the basic response is, you know, I don't know you. Uh, why should I be helping you? You better really have a good story. Now, somebody that, you know, I know, they don't have to have the perfect story. They just have to have a good enough story that I'll still be ha- willing to help them. But the person that comes across and has never created a relationship with me and then wants something from me, better have a perfect story. Because anything less than perfect, then I'm not going to pay attention. I simply don't have the time. Nobody who runs a high-traffic website has the time to spend with people that haven't created a relationship with them. Uh, that's an amen. And and people, you know, I get the same thing. You know, can you help me do this? And I, I don't even know who you are. Or they come out of Timbuktu and they say, can you read my book? No, I can't. Um, and, you know, I'm also also amazed, John, where people will come in and they think, well, it only take, you know, you don't take you a few minutes. Well, going through someone's book is not a few minutes. It could be many, many hours. And that, or I just need a half hour of your time. Well, if you just figure you had five people a day say, I just need a half hour of your time, or I just need three minutes, and that goes to a half hour, that basically you've got a quarter of your day is already shot. And right. I I don't have that time. I don't know about you. I don't have that time. And, and I don't either. Even though in my book, A Thousand One Ways to Market Your Books, I did offer it to anybody that called me that I would take five minutes to answer their questions. And uh, fortunately, not too many people have picked me up on that because, as you said, those five minutes often turn into a half hour of free consulting. Yeah, and, they do. Uh, yeah, yeah, they do. Because, you know, I, I'm too nice. But... The thing is that that's an offer that I made, uh, you know, back 10 years ago, and I, it's still good. But you better make use of your five minutes because, generally speaking, after that five minutes, I'm going to say, you know, the, t- the clock has to start ticking now. That means you need to start paying me. Well, I, I, I think I told... I, my, my wife will kill me. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, I told someone to get their credit card at one time, and I and I give people ten minutes. I've I've told them if you call me, you know, have your questions ready. You've got three three major questions or ten minutes, and that's it. And it's it's consistently, and I and I hammer on this is when I and I just say, well, tell me about your book. They can't tell you succinctly and clearly about their book. Secondly. Yeah. When I ask, well, tell me specifically who your book is for. They don't know who their book is for. Right. So that that is what I just kind of grind on, that you have to be able, as an author, to be very clearly. And if I hear one more author say, oh, my book's for everyone, I think I'm going to throw up on them. Um, <laughs> because they are not. <laughs> books uh, are... Not, you know, everyone hasn't bought the Bible or the Koran or... You know, a lot of other books that have been perennial bestsellers for years and years and years, and still there's a lot of people that have never read them. So to assume that everybody's going to buy your book is pretty naive. It's and, ex- you know, yeah, well, so, I don't even, it's, it's naive, I would put it into, I'm, I'm moving it almost into the stupid category. Um, and this is where my short patience will run out on things, because I, I, I tell authors, when you are writing, I want you to look up whether you're on your computer, on your yellow pad, or you're, you're, you're dictating, however you write, I want you just to look up and I want you to visualize exactly who is across from you. Who is that reader you are writing for? Who is that person? What does he or she look like? What does she do? Create a Bible for me, their storyline. Because when you can get that fixated in your mind, I'm going to guarantee your writing will become easier because you've got a clarity to it. Yeah. Um, and it's a real punch. All right, so move off writing. Oh, but, you know, I'm really surprised by that because, you know, I offer, I'm offer i offering a new service well, an email sales promo uh, to go to bookstores, and uh, then I'll send it out to the bookstores. And I'm amazed how many people, you know, who have bought that service don't have even one testimonial or blurb from a bookseller. And I'm going, this is tough. Because what is the one thing that booksellers will pay attention to? Other it's booksellers. Quote, testimonials from people that they know or they recognize or, or even who they don't recognize but who is an owner or, or manager of a bookstore. 
And that's what they respect. They respect that because they know they're in the same trenches that they are. And I'm amazed how many people think they're going to sell books to bookstores and have never talked to a bookseller and gotten a testimonial from them. Uh, and I'm going, you know, I put it in not just the stupid category, but the insane category. Ah, I like insane. That's a great phrase. <laughs> and you, know, it, you know, when you want to target an audience, you better get some blurbs from that audience. You better get something that they can relate to. Uh, because why would they pay attention to you otherwise? You haven't created the relationships. You haven't done anything to m- merit their attention. Even well, though that, you may have written a great book. It, it, exactly. And it's also that if you're writing a book um, for, you know, a, a book like my last book author, you, you were kind enough to give me a lovely blurb that it, when you're writing, you know who you're writing for, which are authors, but they also authors are tied into recognizing, um, people who are well known in the field, like John Kramer is well known in the authoring publishing field. So when they can see an endorsement from someone who has a blurb from someone who has credibility, that does move it up on the, Pecking order, so to speak. Right. So that's important. All right. So, John, um, on on that, I, I think that's a great point, and also that ties into if your goal is to sell your books and 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 through bookstores, you've got to market to bookstores, and you have got to get people to move their butts and credit cards into bookstores so they buy your book. Would you agree with that? Yes. But again, so. going back to that point about, you know, if you want bookstores to pay attention to you, you've got to get at least one bookseller to love you. Absolutely. Yes. And and there are techniques to do that. Well, we've got about 30 seconds before our next break. And what I would love to do is let's talk about booksellers because actually I don't think they're going to go away. And I actually don't think Barnes & Noble is going to go away. But you may have some opinions on that. But let's get into how do you... The Romancing of the Bookseller. And I'll open with a story about how I romanced the tattered cover because I found out who the key player was that pushed people to the bookshelf and it wasn't the person who ran the store. It was someone else. We'll be right back. This is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. With your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. And we'll be right back with more great information right after the on the Rockstar Radio Network. Since 1987, Color House Graphics has set the standard for quality book production. Whether you decide to print a small quantity of books or need a large print run, depend on Color House to help you. You'll receive professional help and advice the moment you reach one of our representatives. If you mention hearing about us on your guide to book publishing, Judith Bryles, we will provide you with discount on the first order you place. To speak with a project manager, call us toll-free at 800-454-1916 or visit us at www.colorhousegraphics.com. Do you need postcards that make a statement? How about business cards, flyers, brochures, or NCR forms? TuVets is the solution for all your printing needs. Providing services specially designed for authors, we deliver exceptional quality colored printing. Most important of all, we specialize in reducing your printing costs. No more waiting. No more standing in lines at your local printer. Online proofing. With our pricing tools calculator, you can get instant quotes on all your printing products as well as shipping rates all over the United States. Just a few clicks of the mouse and you're on the way to discovering how easy and convenient online color printing should be. Contact our friendly, human, account representatives. We recognize that you want answers, not voice prompts. Visit our website at www.tu-vets.com or call 1-800-894-8977.
When Ned Thompson and Harry Shore started Thompson Shore in 1972, they believed employees with great character would make up the best company. They were right. They hired people who were not only experts in bookmaking, but who were obsessed with quality and delivering exceptional customer service. Almost 40 years later, Thompson Shore remains a 100% employee-owned company. Ned and Harry knew that successful customer projects are a direct result of empowered employees. We specialize in all books for large and small publishers. Creating beautiful and well-made books, we're dedicated to pleasing our customers by making the experience a good one from start to finish. The personal touch we have with our customers allows us to be innovative in solving their most difficult challenges. Our platform also ensures that we can remain flexible to meet our customers' unique needs and expectations. Our marketing kit can create buzz for your title, enhancing the promotion of your book during infancy. When you need to test the market to gauge your future sales, we can provide digitally printed books that will transition seamlessly into a larger offset run. From ebook to hard copy to delivery, our skillful customer service teams are at the ready to answer your most pressing question. At Thompson Shore, we know that making the highest quality books requires more than just best technologies. It requires superior customer service, professionalism to the trade, and commitment to environmental and social values. With these standards of excellence in place, you can be sure that we will always help you put your best book forward. Welcome back to your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask on the Rockstar Radio Network. Coming up, you'll hear more about statistics, scenarios, and strategies on what to do now to get you published. So let's get back to the show. And here again is your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. All right, on your guide to book publishing, we often have some of our sponsors share tips and tidbits. And uh, before we get into the deep dive insight of how to really work and develop those relationships with bookstores, with John Kramer, author of A Thousand One Ways to Market Your Books, Nick Zellinger, the mastermind of NZ Graphics, one of my very favorite interior and exterior book designers, is with us. What's new, Nick? Hi, Judith. Well, I'm going to talk about my topic today, and probably it's better suited for a Dr. Ruth show. Is, but it's, uh, oh, size. fun! <laughs> so they get your attention. Size. Size does matter. That's my topic. Size does matter. <laughs> and the reason why I'm saying that, and you and I have had this discussion before, and we're talking about book cover sizes, of course, but uh, this discussion goes round and round and round and round with different authors. I had an author yesterday that we did her layout, and she decided she wanted to change the size of the book. And I, so that kind of spurred this discussion on. But uh, to your listeners out there who are just starting their book projects, it's really good to research and know an acceptable size for your genre. And, and you and I have talked about that before in regards to fiction. Uh, the bottom line is you want your book to be on display next to the New York Times best-selling books. You want them to look and compete and, uh, and compete with them. So you need to have the same size, uh, and nothing screams more self-published than the wrong size book, like if you've got a 6x9 uh, fiction book, for instance. And I know there are 6x9 trim sizes out there for fiction books, but they're fairly rare uh, with some of the, you know, some authors. So, you know, the current go-to sizes for fiction right now are 5x8 and 5 and a quarter by 8 and 5 and a half by 8 eight and a half. So those are like the three most common sizes uh, that you would consider for fiction. Nonfiction, of course, the door is kind of wide open with that in terms of size because uh, you can go a little bit, a little bit different sizes. Six by nine is very um, common, uh, and some of the landscape sizes, like seven by ten or nine by six, or are like your book. The author of your book was a landscape format. Um, which was very well suited for the the way the uh, book was laid out. Yeah, and it actually that book started at a six by nine, and then I had my little epiphany and said, "This is not going to work." And, yes, and you yeah. you graciously gulped and said, <laughs> "Okay." <laughs> That's right. That was a redo, but it but it yeah. it fit it fit the the uh, intent of the book because the mm-hmm. book was a kind of a journal how to book and how to. And it really fit the art and the the whole approach of it. So for nonfiction, you can really kind of, you know, you, the bottom line is to do your research. 
and to mm-hmm. look out there and see what it is and make sure that you are truly, can, you know, on the same level with the books that are being published by the big houses. Mm-hmm. And and to just recap this, in a discussion that I had, a side discussion with someone who actually sells and pitches to Barnes & Nobles all the time, is that if you're doing 6x9 um, it, it's, and it's fiction, it better be hard back. Otherwise, yep. you do drop to that 5x8, 5 by 8, 5 and a quarter by 8 five and a half by 8 and a half because that is for trade paper. That is what New York's doing. And certainly for self-help, how-to, um, memoirs, all those are in the smaller size. And if you're looking, which ties in with John's you know, our conversation with John Kramer about book marketing, that you've got to compete. We're marketing with them and the positioning in there. And, and you know, for fiction, you want to have body, spine to show. You know, to kind of indicate oh, there's some really good words in here. Yeah, yeah. There's uh, nothing worse than a you know 124 page fiction uh, book at six by nine because that's a uh, novella, and it just uh, you uh-huh. know book buyers know that, and bookstores know that, and certainly book reviewers know that. So uh, you yeah. really have to be cognizant of it. Yeah, and 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 then just on the side that Nick had a issue with another one that he was laying out because no one can make a mind. They went back and forth six by nine, five by eight, five and a half by eight and a half, <laughs> and I finally just said, "Oh, for God's sakes, this isn't even my client, but I know him. He's a member of Author U. I'm going to make the decision for him." And I just said, "Do this, 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 and this," and I got this little email that said, "Thank you from the client." <laughs> yes, and thank you from me because I'm on the way to do it now correctly. So that's really true. Uh, but it's, it's you know, crazy. there's nothing. I mean, it's, you know, you want to be cost effective when you're doing this and save as much money as you can professionally but you know you don't really want to get back into redoing a book because you've you know started down the wrong path exactly all right so nick okay. zellinger nz graphics.com um and really uh if you want a book that has no regrets nick has always been my go-to guy thanks nick thank you Judith. all right so Bye-bye. john Booksellers and bookstores. Here's my secret thing that I found at the Tattered Cover in Denver, Colorado. They have three stores. They're one of the top independents in the country. And that what I found, the secret weapon, secret sauce, was a gal by the name of Jackie who runs the cafe down in the Lodo store. And she has, she is the most prolific reader. If she loves a book, my God, it's going to fly out of that store. And she have given her her own bookshelf. As when you walk in that door by the cafe, it is Jackie's shelf. And I know that she fell in love with my husband's John's book, Have You Ever Held a Mountain? And we sold one, we sold a hundred copies just in, you know, uh, one month, a quiet month, because she put it on her shelf with a say, with a note saying, saying, I love this book. How hot is that? But that's those relationships of going in, personally meeting it, giving them a book. Right, and especially that's true for the local booksellers that fall mm-hmm. in love with them because you can actually meet with them, and they, they really do want to fall in love. And I've heard of people selling, you know, anywhere from 100 to 1,000 books that way with a mm-hmm. good uh, bookseller that's passionate about their book. And, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, I remember reading. Oh, this was about ten, twenty years ago. About an, uh, you know, a bookseller that fell in love with a Midwest novel, and everybody that came into her store found out about that book. And I think she hand sold something like fifteen hundred copies on her own. Everyone needs a cheerleader, and. Yeah. You have to go find it, but there there are booksellers out there that really do love to meet the authors, and also you know what booksellers like food. And I I have another another friend of mine that literally took down an espresso machine, and she took bagels and a toaster. She put herself together, and she became the the <laughs> the uh, snack person, and everybody remembered her. Um, and they supported her book, and they made it a bestseller in that store. Yeah, and, you know, it's all part about creating relationships. You know, in person, you can bring them the bagels and the tea, you know, coffee or whatever. Uh, when you're dealing with, say, online, you have to work some other way. But you, if you offer them good content, if you really take the time to like them and share them and pin them and Google Plus them, then they're going to pay attention to you because you've done your part of the relationship. And a good online relationship is where both sides win and both sides love each other and they continue to promote each other. And, in fact, there was a, 
a promotion going on, an internet promotion for uh, this new service of creating magazines on on uh, the iPad and the mm-hmm. iStore. I saw and that. I really, I really liked the program, but uh, you know, I you know, one of my friends, Mike Koenig, made a super offer where he he said, if you buy this, you'll get one of my new packages for free, a package that he sold for two thousand dollars, another oh. package that I really liked. And so I said, I'm stopping using my affiliate link. From now on, I'm sending my customers to Mike. Wow. I didn't even even tell Mike. I just started doing it. (laughs) Wow. And I have no idea how many people may have bought through my my link to Mike, but my guess is that he made some money off of that. And it's only because he had such a great offer that there was it just was insane for me to try to get people to do it to an offer where I wasn't offering them anything except a good program. (laughs) But Mike was offering that same good program plus his great program, and there you had it. Um, Well, much better. Yeah, exactly. And and to me, you know, because what I try to do in my business is help out the people that follow me, the people that read my newsletter, etc. In fact, I sent out a separate newsletter issue saying, here, go buy from Mike. And... uh, you know, that's something that I'll do because I'm trying to help people. And so something that I think is a neat program, I want them to have it whether I get money off of it or not. Well, and I think so I, I think that's the win-win. The like that. Yeah, I think that's a win-win um, in that. All right, so what of that? We've got a one minute before this next break here. Okay, we went a little bit long with Nick, but what, what's our next? Uh, what else should we be doing besides developing relationships with booksellers? And what do you think about book selling today? And we're going to. I'm going to answer that at, after the break. You can do it. You can start right now. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think there's still things you can do offline that are still have major impact. I think TV still can sell a lot of books. I think magazines can still sell a lot of books. Uh, and, of course, I think booksellers can sell a lot of books. All right. So, so know, Those are some of the things that I think you still need to spend time creating relationships with as well. Okay, and so why do we come the back? The matter is that you still, you know, still have yeah. to all right, so when we come back, John's going to give us three quick tips on building relationships. This is Judith Riles, is your guide to book publishing. This is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. With your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. And we'll be right back with more great information right after these on the Rockstar Radio Network. Writing and reading are moving to the cloud. WaveCloud represents a whole new community for writers and readers to connect, communicate, evaluate, and share. Writers hone their craft and build their business. Readers build their favorites. Sign up for updates at wavecloud.com. The book shepherding concept is simple. The publishing world is changing, and so must you. You need an experienced shepherd and a guide to partner with you as you create, strategize, develop, publish, and achieve your publishing goals. You can't do it alone without paying the price. You can spend your money creating a book that turns out to be so-so, or you can create a book that looks and feels classy, builds your brand, and is a financial success, a bestseller. It's your choice. You choose. You need the book shepherd. Publishing is riddled with obstacles, sometimes nightmares for the author. You don't need problems. You want solutions. Dr. Judith Bryles will shepherd you through the maze and the chaos. At times, she's had to step in and rescue a book, a book that has been sabotaged by a publisher or by a publishing service provider or sometimes even the author themselves. Judith Bryles is the book shepherd if you want to create a book with no regrets. Give her a call today, 303-885-2207. That's 303-885-2207 or email her at judith at bryles.com. By the way, Bryles is spelled B-R-I-L-E-S. Follow Judith on Twitter at My Book Shepherd and on Facebook at The Book Shepherd.
At Total Printing Systems, customer service is our priority. We are located in Southern Illinois. Our employees have an average of 18 years experience and know that customer relationships are important to our continued success. We have been a short-run book printer for nearly 40 years and always stay at the forefront of technology. Our niche is from 1 to 5,000 copies. Today, we offer digital black and white and four-color high-speed inkjet printing, a cost-effective way to introduce color into your short-run titles. We, of course, offer traditional offset printing as well. Bindery is done in-house, from adhesive case binding to PUR perfect binding to mechanical binding of all types, including side sewing. We provide warehousing, kitting, distribution, inventory management, a new print-on-demand facility, streaming browser-based ebooks, and bookstore. Call us at 1-800-465-5200 for a quote on your next book project. You can also visit our website at www.tps1.com. Welcome back to your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask on the Rockstar Radio Network. If you want to write and publish a book, if you want to be successful as an author, your guide to book publishing, everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask, is for you. Stay tuned and you'll hear about statistics, scenarios, and strategies on what to do now to get you published. So let's get back to the show. And here again is your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. All right, with me this hour has been the amazing John Kramer, the author of 1001 Ways to Market Your Books. We're talking about marketing. We've been focusing on some Internet. We talked about working with bookstores and going in. And basically what John says, and when it comes to marketing, it is all about relationships and building them, whether it's online or offline. So, John, what other tidbits can we add on to this? Well, the best way to create relationships with anybody is to interview them, just like you're doing here with me. You know, every time you interview me, you strengthen our relationship. Every time I interview you, I strengthen our relationship. Because what happens in an interview, you get to actually know the person. The best kind of interview, of course, is uh, like, uh, you know, a blog talk radio or, you know, internet radio show like this, or a podcast or a Google Hangout, which is the new hot thing. But, you know, the minute, you, you know, and the neat thing is that there are a lot of people that you maybe want to create a relationship with who will respond positively to being interviewed, to doing a Google Hangout with you. Now, of course, they're not going to do it if you blindside them. You know, you come out of the blue and say, I want to interview you. But if you've been tweeting about them, if you've been blogging about them, if you've been resharing some of their information you've built you started building that relationship and now you come to them and say you know i love what you do i'd love to interview you for my uh internet radio radio show i'd love to interview you on a google hangout or uh, in a tower seminar anything like that Mm -hmm. that's going to make a difference and and the thing is the interview doesn't have to be long it can be five or ten minutes all the way up to an hour any interview is going to start to build a relationship. And, you know, the minute that I've been interviewed by somebody, I mean, you know, like you, you said to me, you know, I really love doing it. I have fun interviewing you. Well, the fact that you have fun is, and I have fun, that means that we've built a closer relationship. And mm-hmm. the minute that you interview somebody live, you've built that relationship so that offline you can ask them, Hey, you know, I really love doing that. Would you blah, blah, blah? Mm -hmm. And you can then ask them something more. And and most likely they'll say yes. If they can do it, they can work it out, they'll do it. Yes, and and that's because you're now a friend of theirs. It's amazing how close you can get to somebody through doing an interview. So to me, that's the top-notch strategy is to ask somebody to do a live interview uh, and if you have an internet radio show, you do it th- through that. If you have a regular podcast, you do it through that. Uh, if you uh, do Google Hangouts, you do it through that. Uh, you know, any way that you can do it that, that they're comfortable with. And let uh, me ask you what like yeah, John. Doing video, so they won't want to do a Google Hangout, but they yeah. uh, might very much like to do an internet radio show. 
Well, let me ask you about Hangouts because, um, I mean, actually, I have done media, by the way, on Hangouts, where I have been involved in a Hangout in, from a newsroom in Kansas City, another one in Oklahoma. So that works fine. And that, uh, that is when you're doing Hangouts or you're doing on air, is there kind of a norm now that people are trying to keep their, their show length? Let's say you, I know because author you is going to start Google Hangouts on air this month. Um, that, you know, do you go for 50 minutes? Do you go for half hour? Because a lot of our listeners may not know the on air, you know, streams up to YouTube because Google owns YouTube. But <laughs> you, you have that. So is there a norm that people are looking for these days? I haven't seen a norm. Uh, mm-hmm. I've seen very many successful Google Hangouts go for an hour and a half. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you've got the right content and you keep people interested, you can They're engaged. On. Yeah. But, you know, if you're doing interviews uh, rather than, say, you know, a whole sales promo or something like that, I would probably keep the interview to 20 minutes or less. Per person or just for yeah. the whole show? For the whole show. Okay. Because why do it per person when you can always do a second hangout and more promo for the next one? And lead and into that. So a, a couple of years ago, I did a series of what I call 20-minute podcast mm-hmm. series. And I did it a, a month-long series where I interviewed authors. And my main purpose was to promote these authors, but mm-hmm. also to have content for my website. And uh, I saw my website jump in traffic during that time because the authors, of course, were doing their job, which was send traffic to my website while I was doing my job sending traffic to their website. Mm-hmm. So it's a it's a uh, I'll pat you and you pat my back and it's it's yes. it works both ways. John, t- let and me you ask. Know, that's part of creating a relationship is that whole thing of, you know, if somebody hosts you on their website or in a podcast or Google Hangout, your job is to promote that and send traffic to them because that's why they're they're using you. That's why they're creating that relationship with you is that they want traffic to their website, more traffic. And so your job is to help them have more traffic to your blog post, your interview, whatever, and then that comes back to you. Exactly. Let me ask you this before, because there, you know, uh, Barnes and Noble was in the media uh, this past month about the stepping down of their um, head honcho, uh, and I remember I actually was alarmed when I started seeing some of the shutdown that I called Marcella Smith, who, as you know, used to be the director of the small press division for Barnes and Noble, and Marcella's on our advisory board for Author You, and she just said, Judith, this thing was this was totally in the plans years ago that as because so many of these stores were such high end leases um, in some of these malls and strips and stuff that they just made a decision that they, as the leases matured, they were just going to probably shut down and consolidate. So there's nothing new here in the closing of some of these stores. What's your take on what's going on? Well, I'm sure that what she said is probably uh, really accurate. Uh, at the same time, I think that Barnes and Noble probably did overextend. Mm hmm. So they do need to clean out some of the uh, lesser performing uh, stores, especially in regards to, you know, what their lease is and the cost is for that particular store. Um, bookstores are certainly having trouble. I mean, there's no question about that. But the neat thing is that there are a lot of new independent stores opening up uh, every month. And uh, to me, that's, that's, that's indicative of the passion that people still have for bookstores. Uh, bookstores are an incredible social network, networking opportunity. I mean, a lot of people go to bookstores simply to meet people of like mind. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so I think bookstores are going to be around for a long time. Cat yeah. Cover is going to be, because they have such an incredible model, uh, are going to be around, you know, even if physical books disappear, Cat Cover will still be around in some form. Yeah, well, I, you know, and I don't believe physical books no are just books are printed, let's say mm-hmm. all books go to e-books, there's still going to be an incredible market for used books. Yeah, well, I, and actually, I don't believe that uh, e-books are going to eliminate print books. I actually came back from a trip. I was in Columbus, Ohio two weeks ago, and interesting, as I looked around me, people were holding print books reading. Um, the people who had electronic stuff were doing email 
posting email and playing games or watching a movie. But the book reading, interesting, was back to the print books. And I know the Tattered Cumber has recently reported to me that that they're seeing an increase in book sales. And there's data that shows on retention in kids now that if you're using totally electronic versus the print model, the cognitive side, retention is not as high. So I think that there's going to be some stuff that you may see a little bit retracing um, um, different ways. And as I know that John Zeck, who heads up the Tattered Press, uh, um, uh, their Tattered Cover Press division said that they're finding that parents are saying, wait a minute, these kids, their imaginations are kind of going flat because some of these books, they do everything the new tablets, they do everything that they're not even doing the what if anymore as the kids in a dialogue. So the parents are now coming back to the print book so they have the dialogue with their kid. Like they want a relationship with their kid versus the kid having the relationship with the tablet. I thought that was all interesting. Well, there's a new st- there was a study I just read recently that, that said that uh, students, college students that take notes on an iPad or you know a computer, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, score twenty percent less than people that uh, on, on tests than people that uh, take notes by hand. Oh, I believe that because there's something with the motion of the hand and doing it and connected with the brain. There's studies that show that there's a higher retention right. with that. All right, so we have two minutes. A couple of more tips for our listeners before we exit exit for the day. <laughs> well, the main thing is to care about the people that you want to create relationships with. If you really like what they're doing and if you really uh, care about what they're doing, that will come through in your approach to them, and that's what's going to make them say yes to you. If you just come to them and, it, and it's a generic sort of pitch, what, what's their incentive? Why would they care? That's why, you, to me, you know, they, they say that high tech is still very much high touch, and it really does matter, the relationships. You know, Tim Ferriss did his successful blog tour uh, by creating relationships by taking people out for drinks at conferences. And that's how he created his relationships with the top Internet marketers that then went on to promote his four-hour work week. Ah, so the booze factor was in play. The booze factor. All right. It's almost, it's almost All right. like the cooties factor. Oh, God, here we go. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so with that, we're going to do a wrap-up. I want to thank John Kramer. Everyone should go to bookmarket.com, sign up for his easing, pay attention. The man knows what he's doing, and make sure you come to Author You Extravaganza next May 1 to 3 next year here in Denver because John will be sharing it all. Thanks, John. Glad to have Thanks you back. All right. Thank you for being a part of your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. With your host, Dr. Judith Brock.